This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. This weekend, we're featuring an interview Jeff had on the Freeman Beyond the Wall podcast with Mance Rader. Stay tuned for a wide-ranging discussion on Rothbard, monetary policy, immigration, and more. We have discussed, we have talked about um, in going back and forth on Twitter, talking about Murray Rothbard. And when it comes down to it, would there be a Mises Institute without Murray Rothbard? I suspect not. It's hard to say. Uh, Lou was close with him. And uh, the short answer is probably no. Okay. I was going to ask you what you think he would have thought of Ron Paul's run up in 2008. But I think a better question would be, what do you think he would have thought of George W. Bush's run up in 2000? Considering the fact that when we look back on that and we look at the speeches and the things he said in the debate, he basically sounded like a libertarian candidate. I mean, what did you think at that time? What do you think he would have thought? Well, Murray had a a serious ear for politics and a very jaundiced tongue (laughs) for (laughs) for political campaigns. I think he would have seen through W, you know, certainly not an intellectual by any stretch. And I think he would have he would have seen that that Bush Jr. represented the worst of the the neoconservative end as opposed to the Rockefeller end, but also uh, somebody who is wishy-washy on economics and, and fiscal issues. So, you know, I guess the, be- the best thing W said during his campaign was talking about a kinder, gentler foreign policy. Well, that all went out the window, obviously, on 9-11. So I, I suspect he would have been as hard on him as he, as he was on his dad. Uh, yeah. You know, it's and it's really, really a terrible thing that Bush was elected in many ways from a, from a liberty perspective. I think we might be better off if Gore had been elected in that famous recount in Florida because I, I don't, I'm not sure that Gore would have gone his whole hog uh, into Iraq and Afghanistan because we have to remember that when W came into office, the national debt, maybe not as a political matter, but as a as a in terms of the math, in terms of the numbers, the the national the debt still could have been wrestled to the ground, and the dollar still could have had some sort of uh, of potential. It was about it was a, a little over five trillion dollars when Bush entered office in the, at the beginning of two thousand one. Of course, now it's twenty trillion. So you know, if you do the math, if there had been some combination of Medicare and Social Security cuts and means testing. Um, it still might have been doable, but it's sort of like James Dean. When James Dean was was in the car, was in the Porsche hurtling towards the cliff, and he's going around the corner, and he's going too fast. Uh, think of it this way. There was still a chance that th- there was still a point at which James Dean could have applied brakes or counter steering or something to prevent himself from going over the cliff. But at some point when you're, you know, when you're too close to it, you're beyond the, the point of rescue. There's no longer anything he could have done to prevent himself from going over the cliff. And, and that event essentially happened for, the, for America in 2001 because three very bad things happened. Um, 9-11 sent federal spending and federal warmongering into hyperdrive. And within the next couple of years, we invaded, well, immediately we invaded Afghanistan, but within a couple of years, we in- invaded Iraq, uh, both of which blew uh, deficit spending up towards a trillion dollars a year. And then uh, not too long later, because Bush wanted to defeat John Kerry in 2004, um, he engineered along with, uh, along with a, a very willing pharmaceutical industry, what we call Medicare Part D, which was just a naked sop to senior citizens so that they would vote for him over John Kerry. Um, That's how politics works. That's how democracy works. You give people something, or at least the perception that you give them something, and they vote for you. So uh, the unholy combination of trying to pay for two wars simultaneously in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then creating Medicare Part D, which at the time and even today isn't that big of an expenditure, but, but in, in, in an actuarial sense, over time, 
the prescription drug benefit that seniors will get will actually cost more than the original Medicare Act, which is just you know providing doctor visits and, and, and treatment and that sort of thing. The, the drugs cost more over the decades. So basically, my argument is that in that period between George W. Bush coming into office in 2000 and about 2005, at which point Met, uh, Medicare Part D had passed and the two wars were in full swing, uh, America's uh, fiscal house went around the bend and over the cliff to the point where it could never be rescued. And now, of course, with $20 trillion and uh, uh, an aging population with, you know, the cohort over 65 is going to about double in the next 20 years, which means entitlements will be, particularly Medicare and Social Security will just be, will just uh, rise exponentially. Um, and, And then all the accumulated debt at some point we're going to have to raise interest rates to attract anyone to our treasury debt. And, and as you know, I'm sure just, just raising interest rates a couple points would, would quickly make uh, servicing the debt the single biggest budget item uh, that for Congress every year. So 9-11 really, really was a watershed moment for the United States and not in the way the mainstream media thinks it was, but it's, it's, it's a terrible time. And, um, and conservatives who refused to repudiate Bush, Bush Jr., have simply lost it completely. They've lost any credibility, any claim to some mantle of limited government or fiscal responsibility. And they're a complete joke, rightfully so. So it's uh, a, painful, a painful time for America. But to the extent it opened anyone's eyes with the resulting Ron Paul campaigns, to the folly of our war intervention and the impossibility of our entitlement spending, then that's the silver lining, man. That's what we have to to think about and 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 work on. Well, not only that. I mean, look at the last seven years. Look at uh, how did the Fed decide that they wanted to fix the two thousand the two thousand eight crisis? Zero interest rates for how long? Seven years. I mean, it, interest rates almost at zero for seven years when interest rates at zero or just a, a little bit higher than that for two years led up to the 2008 crisis. Not only that, I remember 2004 v- very clearly being in Fort Lauderdale and hearing, reading that George W. Bush said that every American had a right to a home. Hmm. And when I heard that, I was it was the same thought I had always had about student loans is, well, why, are, why is education so high? Well, if you're giving away free money, I'm going to raise, you know, for, for my product, I'm going to raise the prices too. And it's, if the general public, if, and, and public schools, government schools will never teach this, but simple economics, just requiring them to read. I read Tom Woods' Meltdown before I actually read Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt. And by reading Meltdown, I think I read it twice. I kept make copious notes on it. And I had a general understanding of what I knew, you know, he basically everything I knew that was leading up to that point that I couldn't put together, that I couldn't, that I couldn't have a full understanding of that book made me understand it. But now, now with um, people do not realize why the stock market is as high as it is. They think that this is happening organically and it's not. If this, if we saw just a housing bubble in 2008 because of low interest rates and easy money look at what we've had in the last 7 years what i mean what do you think we're what do you think we're coming up i mean i know that everybody you know if you have a background in austrian economics you're oh, you know they accuse you of always being a bear but how can you not be with, with all the evidence we have up until now well, I think that the that central banks around the world, and particularly ours, will do anything and everything they can to keep equity markets high nominally. Um, the Bank of Japan already does this. The Bank of Japan buys Japanese equities. It buys stocks in Japanese companies to, to prop them up. Now, so far, uh, quantitative easing, which the Fed says is coming to an end and has tapered away, uh, so far, they've only bought some bad subprime mortgage-backed security debt from various commercial banks and also, of course, huge amounts of U.S. Treasuries. But you can never believe what they say because as recently 
as 2010. James Bullard, who was head of the St. Louis Fed, was saying, well, you know, all these purchases we've made since the crash will all be unwound or sold off or allowed to mature. And uh, when it's all said and done, we'll return to the same level of Fed balance sheet as before the crisis. Of course, now they're saying, well, we're not going to return to that, but maybe we'll return to, return to two or three trillion. Um, and if you recall, the Fed's balance sheet went from about 600 uh, billion to about f- a little over 4.2 trillion at its peak. So, you, you know, they, they keep moving the goalposts, they keep changing the story. And to the financial press, which is the most credulous bunch of, you know, court reporters you ever saw, uh, they keep saying, well, you know, Janet Yellen's steady hand and, and her replacement Powell seems like he'll keep the same course and all this and that. You know, central bankers are groping around in the dark. They don't know what to do, and they're terrified of, of letting things crash. So the, the criticism leveled at Austrians and Austrian business cycle theory ha- is, is certainly legitimate in the sense that it, it doesn't tell you when and how all, all of this will result in, in bad things for the economy. It just says, well, when you, when you artificially inflate something, that it has to pop at some time. Um, So I understand the frustration with Austrians who the public says, well, you guys are perma bears, you're always doomsaying. I get that. And and I also get that what people really want from economists is timing. You know, when is this, when is the housing, the current housing bubble going to burst? When is the the, uh, stock market going to burst? The problem is, is that we can't know what the Fed will do. Is is it really that far-fetched to think that the Fed would buy FANG stocks since tech seems to be driving all the gains in the stock market right now? No, I don't think it's that far-fetched because, and if you do, I would say this, do you think it was far-fetched in 2007 that the Fed would suddenly increase its balance sheet five times over in just a year or two? Yeah, you would have said, oh my gosh, Jeff, that's far-fetched. So um, there's no more normal monetary policy. There's, everything now is extraordinary, so-called monetary policy, and it's an artificial form of trying to engineer the economy Everybody knows that more money, base money, or more credit doesn't equal more goods and services in the economy. It doesn't make us wealthier. Um, So it's it's a form of financial alchemy. And and unfortunately, it's probably the most underreported story in America or in the West. Uh, You know, people just don't talk about it. It's not reported. And it's just presumed that half of every transaction, meaning the money side versus the good or service that's being bought with that money, that half of every transaction will involve a a dollar or a euro or a yen or a a Swiss franc or whatever that is manipulated and engineered by a central bank. Nobody sits around and says... We ought to have, well, <laughs> some people sit around, man, but, but <laughs> most people don't sit around and say, you know, we ought to have a board of governors that, for the auto industry in America. <laughs> and they should sit around every year and decide how many cars are going to be manufactured, what the price of each car will be, how much auto workers will be paid, uh, and when the cars should come out. You know, everyone would say, oh, my God, that sounds like Soviet planning. But that's effectively what we do with interest rates in the dollar. So it's, to me, very, very scary and and the biggest untold story in the U.S. And when this bubble finally bursts, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to look to the two-party system. Well, not everybody, but the the overwhelming majority of people are going to look to the two-party system. The Democrats are going to blame it on capitalism and they're going to blame it on Trump and they're going to blame it on a free market, which none of those things would have anything to do with it. And the right is going to say things like this was engineered to make Trump look bad. Things like I mean, it's it almost seems like you can't get the word out there of sound money and sound business and you know sound trade because whenever something happens where you can, which is a teachable moment, you know, to borrow a phrase from the previous president, it's always a blame game. And no one wants to, no one wants to learn by the mistakes. Everybody wants to blame somebody else. So let me ask you, if somebody just wanted to come to you and talk about economics, how would you, and they knew nothing about, you know, nothing about Austrian economics, nothing about a free market, even close. 
what would you use as because you're always going to have to play on people's emotions you find that thing that they're emotional about, you talk to them about it, you give them facts about it, and then it really gets them thinking, but they have to be interested in it. What do you think is something that is a, something that pretty much everybody would be interested in that we can talk to them about to ex- to start to try to expose them to how much of a house of cards this is? Well, what scares me and what I think touches a lot of people on a, on a deep emotional level is this terrible situation with millennials. I mean, is anyone noticing (laughs) this is the first generation basically in U.S. history that has diminished expectations relative to their parents? I mean, this is a shocking development to have a whole group of kids. And I'll, I'll use millennials broadly to say people born in the 80s and 90s. Okay. You know, a whole group of kids who says, well, I'm probably not going to have as good a job as my parents. I'm probably not going to have as good a house. I'm probably not going to have a family, whatever it is. I mean, that that's really astonishing because whether it's self-delusional or not, America, with all of its checkered history, has always had a, a sunny optimism that European countries don't have. You know, we're not a deterministic country. We're not a fatalistic country. And so to me, this is something people can understand on a visceral, non-intellectual level, that something's wrong. They may not understand exactly what that is or agree with us. Not everybody agrees with us, of course, about what's wrong. But the point is that, you know, no, nobody's looking at the stock market and saying, oh, my gosh, America's doing great. No, nobody's looking at unemployment numbers and saying, gee, everyone's really, uh, we have full employment. Everybody knows that a lot of people dropped out after 08 and that the the unemployment figures are, you know, whether they look at them scientifically or not, they they just have a sense, an unease that things have been hollowed out and that, uh, especially since the crash of 08, that it's just harder. It's harder for young people to get on a career track job. It's harder to save money. It's harder to have the down payment for a house. It's, it's harder to increase your real income or your savings, even though housing seems to be going up faster, especially in coastal areas and, and expensive cities, than, than your ability to save for a down payment, that sort of thing. You know, people feel this and they, they get it. There, there's an unease in America. There's no question about that. Even before Trump, there was an unease in America. And we have to use that and tap into that, I think. That would be that would be my approach for a layperson. Then if you get them even talking or thinking, maybe give them Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson <laughs> because yeah. there's no better book. The beauty of that book is you can give it to somebody and they don't have to read it chronologically or, or, or even cover to cover. They can read a discrete chapter on rent control or uh, tariffs or whatever it is and, and not even read the rest of the book. So if you want to be uh, ecumenical, that's the way to go. A lot of people want to talk about money and bring it up in conversations. What about the people who are more philosophical, more morality-based? What topic would you suggest that you bring up to try and you know bring them over to our side? Well, I guess you got it depends on the, the recipient of your... Uh, of your hectoring, man. <laughs> uh, you, you know, yeah, if they have, um, if there's, if there's bumper stickers all over the back about how you have to support the troops and this and that, yada yada, you might not want to go the anti-war route just off the jump, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the the drug war is probably the single place where the libertarian, I won't say necessarily libertarians have had the most success, but the libertarian perspective has had the most success. In just in in a relatively short time, people's attitudes on drugs have changed radically, and that's due to the a lot of hard work by a lot of people over a lot of years to say this is crazy, and maybe what it really took was just the states themselves sort of shrugging, and saying, mm-hmm. you know, we just can't keep having what what's effectively an unfunded federal mandate where every every time our cops pull someone over and a guy's got a little bit of a joint in his ashtray, all my you know, all of a sudden we we're putting him in handcuffs, we have all this paperwork, the cop has to take half a day, you're taking this guy downtown, the the public defender has to get involved, the prosecutor has to get involved, he's in jail for a day and a half. I, I mean the just the cost of this is so crazy and so out of whack 
that I, I don't care if someone wants to end the drug war for pragmatic reasons rather than ideological reasons. Uh, right. I, I just want it ended. And so, you know, medical marijuana, well, not I, I should say, I shouldn't say medical marijuana. I, I should say legal med- marijuana in various states, Colorado being sort of the leader, is really an unbelievable libertarian success story. And Michael Bolden of the Tenth Amendment Center reminded me the other day that I, I didn't remember correctly, but at the beginning of his, the first couple years of his first term, then President Obama had sort of tried to send in the feds mm-hmm. to bust up dispensaries and arrest everyone and seize their inventory and all that. But then towards the, the second half or maybe a second term, to his credit, he kind of stopped doing that. So it's a little bit of Irish democracy in the sense that there may be federal laws on the books that preempt state law. I don't believe in federal preemption, but mo- you know, in the, in the current legal climate, you have federal laws on the books that preempt state laws and say X, Y, and Z is illegal in, in, in the drug arena. And states just kind of say, well, okay, we're, we're just not going to follow the federal law. And, and that sets up a potential showdown. Is somebody going to sue the state in federal court? Are the, is the uh, Justice Department going to send in a bunch of federal cops? Um, you know, Obama, to his credit, stopped doing that at some point. And now I think, I think the genie's out of the bottle on marijuana. And it may be slower than we wish it would be. And, it, and there may still be a lot of dumb thinking about so-called harder drugs, but it, it is a great success story. And, and it, it's one I think, you know, provides a, a bit of a roadmap to us for how we can, we can uh, go about other libertarian legislation. It's, it's um, you know, it's tough because it's been gradual and incremental, and that doesn't satisfy the radical in many of us. But man, look at, look at what the progressives did in, incrementally in the 20th century. Oh, my God. So, you know, we got to take our victories where we can find them, I guess. Do you think, do you think liberty can be won that way through the, um, through the political process? I I don't know. I don't know. I, and it's, I, I do know this. I don't think that we are oppressed in the sense that we would be justified in, in, in some sort of physical armed revolution. I, I don't, as awful as things are in many ways, not always, but in many ways from a libertarian perspective, I don't think we, from a proportionality argument and, and from just a human argument, I don't think we have that sort of right of self-defense that, uh, and, and a lot of good libertarians would disagree and say we absolutely have reached that point. I get that. Um, I mean, I, personally, I'm a, a Rothbardian and cap. I don't, I'm not someone who believes it, that the state is necessary even to provide so-called national defense or police or judiciary. Um, but, but that being said, if, if Rand Paul or, or uh, somebody like that can throw a monkey wrench in a, an NSA or FISA amendment in the Senate, that's great too. I'm, I'm all for a, a multi-pronged approach. But the bigger question is whether human beings in the West who are quite comfortable materially will ever really change things politically absent some sort of cataclysmic event? Do we need an economic collapse? Do we need a war? Do we need some big political event to rouse us from our slumber? Um, I, I don't know. That's a question about human nature. That goes to psychology and, and all kinds of things that I'm not equipped to answer. I hope that's not the case. I hope we can turn this thing around without having some awful crash that that hurts a lot of people. But history and and human nature tell us that that might not be possible. In the age of Trump, since we've seen Trump get elected and even before, it seems that a lot of liberty minded people, people that think like us, have glommed on to this idea of building a border wall and they don't mind that taxation, they don't, taxation isn't theft anymore. They don't mind taxes going towards a border wall, something that they wouldn't have talked about three or four years ago. What do you, what do you think has happened? Well, I don't know that any libertarians are talking about a, a border wall. I think Trump people are, uh, you know, it's certainly become a hill that a lot of libertarians want to die on, which is this idea of, Borders. So, I'd lo- if if you want to talk about borders, I'd love to just discuss it. Maybe I can frame it a little different 
than people might have heard it framed. Go ahead and um, do it. You know, the the question here is, I don't know any libertarians, including Hoppe or Kinsella or anyone else who who want government in charge of borders. I, I think that's a, a bit of a misnomer. So starting with that, you know, I, I heard a a prominent libertarian the other day, this might have been a week or so ago, I probably saw it on Facebook or something, say, I'm for completely open borders with the only proviso that for uh, criminal background checks and and public health. And I started to think about that a little bit. And I, I'm I'm basically an open borders guy, depend, myself, Jeff, d- depending on the semantics here. And so I was thinking about that for a while and I thought, man, imagine this. What would a criminal background check and public health check really look like? Well, first of all, you'd have to detain folks physically somewhere while this was occurring. Is this going to be some sort of camp with with walls and barbed wire while you keep these poor people in there? And and good luck with a criminal background check on people from uh, the less developed world where there's not a lot of record keeping and that sort of thing, or people with generic names, like someone from uh, a Hispanic country who has a very generic last name like Garcia, or somebody from, you know, who has a generic last name like Smith. You know, criminal background checks, that, that sounds like a really daunting sort of administrative task that would require quite a big effort at the border. And, and then public health checks. I mean, are we going to are we going to draw blood from people? That's pretty invasive. Are we going to uh, take swabs from the inside of their mouth? Are we going to ca- ask them to undress so we can check them? Uh, for communicable diseases or whatever it might be. And I was thinking to myself, this, some open borders. I mean, that sounds pretty uh, pr- pretty uh, close to me. I mean, I would favor, obviously, a private system. But I-, I would also argue that unless and until governments go away, they're always going to define themselves by borders. In other words, borders would be sort of the last thing to go because that's really how politicians define themselves is uh, monopoly control over a certain population in a certain geography defined by borders. Um, I I think we're looking at this a a little wrong. I I think you leave people alone and see what they do. I think immigration should be a very localized decision like it is in Switzerland. I think the vast majority of Americans are completely happy with letting smart, hardworking, especially people with some capital come here and they don't want criminal, lazy, bad people coming here. And the market can take care of this um, by, by itself. And there's certain areas that need lots and lots of immigrants because they're not populated enough and they have a demand for, for workers or jobs. And there's some places that are really, really crowded that might say, well, we don't, we don't need any immigrants here. So I, I think the marketplace could sort this out. But it's a really difficult question in the current environment, just like welfare is a really difficult question in the current environment. So I think when people say, well, this is the hill we have to die on, we ought to have uh, closed borders, and even if that means the government enforcing them, because if we don't, a bunch of really non-libertarian people from the third world are going to come here and ruin any chance to have a less statist America. I don't really agree with that, but the, the flip side... Uh, a lot of critics of the Mises Institute will say, oh, my God, those those authoritarian status at the Mises Institute, unless we have completely open borders on a national level, you know, if you advocate anything other, you lose your libertarian incorporated badge or something. Um, I just I just kind of shrug and I say it's like anything else. It, I think the market could handle it. And I think we're overthinking borders. Yeah. That's that's my two cents today anyway yeah i've um i've actually heard in the past week or so i think you said that you you listened to my last podcast where i was i wouldn't name a libertarian a journalist who just openly admitted that he has no background in liberty he just does it for the journalism i think you said you had heard that well he he basically in the same interview just you know pointed at the mises institute pointed at auburn and just brushed it away, you know, and I've heard people recently refer to the Mises Institute as the Paleo Libertarian Institute. And I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how that, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where all that came from. You know, I mean, I think everybody went through, anybody who supported Ron Paul in 2008, 
went through a paleo libertarian phase because a lot of what he was talking about was you know had some classic paleo libertarianism to it but yeah it, it seems like a lot of people have been pointing the finger uh you're, you're you guys way lately um saying that you're that the mises institute is no longer libertarian and i just um i'm not really seeing it do you think that's just hate well i would ask i would ask a very simple question of anyone uh, and and I understand the left and right libertarian division. It it, it makes sense if, to categorize people, but it's a very human thing, and it's okay. I mean, I think what we're talking about in terms of left and right libertarians is more cultural preferences that are extra libertarian that don't involve the state per se. Uh, so the, here's the question to anyone: Do you advocate significantly reducing or eliminating the role of the state on any issue? That's all I care about. If somebody if somebody arrives at Libertarian because they read, you know, Benjamin Tucker or if they read uh, Sam Conklin, th then that's great. If somebody arrived at Libertarianism because they read Rothbard or Hoppe, that's great. Who cares? In other words, are you willing to let the chips fall where they may? Uh, would you still advocate a more libertarian society or a fully libertarian society if it turns out that your cultural preferences were diminished? in that society? It, for me, the answer is yes. I, I, you know, personally, I'm, I'm not religious, but I do have a lot of sympathy for Christianity as a moderating influence for what we could very broadly call Western civilization. So in the eyes of a lot of people, they, they would probably categorize me as a right libertarian. Uh, okay, I, I can live with that. But would I also prefer a more libertarian society if that meant uh, lots and lots and lots of social arrangements that weren't really my cup of tea. Yes, I would. So that that's the question I have. I, I don't, you know, I don't care if someone's a left libertarian. I I, I care, and I happen to uh, disagree if they attack the Mises Institute. Okay, that seems silly. What if you don't like Rothbard, or if you don't like all of Rothbard, for example? Well, you don't have to read him. I, he's brought a lot of people to a libertarian perspective. And we're talking about a guy who wrote 30 books, who wrote a thousand articles, who wrote, you know, a hundred chapters in other people's books over a, a span of many, many, many decades. So it would be a bit odd if you agreed with every word he said, and I don't. Um, but I, look, if you're asking me about attacks on the Mises Institute, I'm, I'm kind of biased. So <laughs> you should probably ask a neutral third party. How about that? Yeah, that makes sense. But, you know, it, when it comes to the Mises Institute, if you if you don't like Rothbard's style or if you think somebody's attacking somebody, read someone like Bob Higgs. He's not attacking anybody. Has Bob Higgs ever written anything that's offended anybody? <laughs> so there is there's plenty to choose from there. Um, I guess what I'll end with is the Mises Institute has meant a lot to me. I've ordered books there for over the from there over the years. I've downloaded PDFs. I've sent people there to download PDFs over the years. I love the story um, that Bob Murphy told this week on uh, on Dave Smith's show. How you know it used to be that people would write letters to the Mises Institute and say, "Can I get a copy of this?" and they'd have to mail it to them. And now they just look at you know how things have changed in the internet. You can just look at how many PDF downloads you had for a week, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure books like Anatomy of the State and things like that are it's amazing. So tell people you know what the Mises Institute has to offer them as far as educating themselves for libertarianism and for liberty well that's uh, that's really our mission and it started out as more of an academic mission that we were trying to help PhDs in their own learning and try to help them with jobs and with uh, networking and all that was very different very much more difficult back in the 80s my god I you know, it was so much better if you're a libertarian or Austrian leading academic today trying to get a job. But it's really our, our mission morphed over the years into more of a lay friendly uh, mission because I don't think basic economics is beyond the ken of the average person. But more importantly, it ought not to be because ignorance about economics is what lets the political class and the and the central bankers get away with all this nonsense while the public sort of stares at their navels and, and watches the NFL playoffs, right? So it, it, we all have an obligation to not be dumb, 
on economics and political philosophy because it's the stuff of everyday life and it affects us whether we want to put our heads in the sands or not. So that's really become our target audience is just the reasonably curious and educated lay person. Uh, and we want to make as much content available to that person for free on whatever platform, whether, you know, some people are want to just occasionally uh, read an article that they that looked interesting from a tweet that showed up on their Twitter feed. And, th- and that's all the economics education they care to consume. And that's fine. And some people want to come to the Mises Institute, go to Mises U, and then dive into make, make economics their career. And they want to be consumed by this stuff and go be, become a PhD and maybe teach people. And, and that's okay, too. We want to be everything in between. Uh, but at the end of the day, we want to be an alternative education uh, for people. We want to be an alt school that lets people, you know, consume as much or, or as little as they want for free and learn something about what we would consider proper or correct economics. And yeah, we promote a particular school. And is there a bias there? Yeah, I, I suppose there is. But the flip side is that the the whole world's promoting what we'll call some mishmash of neo-Keynesian neoliberalism, which is you know, to summarize, is a demand side mentality. The idea that you either use fiscal policy or monetary policy to make people go out and buy more stuff and want more stuff and make it easier for people to consume. And that's how you drive a prosperous economy. Of course, we know that that's not true. We know that that's very, very dangerous and oftentimes fatal. And that production and and productivity and capital accumulation are what healthy economies are all about. So, you know, when our critics, even our left libertarian critics, but but more importantly, our mainstream critics say, oh, my gosh, you guys are just promoting this cranky Austrian economics and it's so it's it's so ideological and it's biased. Well, we're a drop in the bucket compared to thousands and thousands and thousands of taxpayer funded economics departments across the country, huge foundations, huge think tanks that promote views very opposite to ours. So I, I think I find this pushback a little amusing and, and I also uh, take it as an indicator that we're having some impact and some effect and that we're bothering some people. So, you know, if you're, if you're interested in economics, come to Mises.org, dig around a little bit, find a book you like, uh, and uh, I, I think you'll be rewarded. And if you're not, uh, I would just say, okay, then go consume libertarian content somewhere else. And uh, God bless. And, you know, so that that's, that's my... Um, ecumenical approach. And uh, that that's, to me, what the Mises Institute is all about, providing free education for smart lay people. Mm, that's, uh, Mises.org has done so much to increase my knowledge, um, philosophically and, and economically. And I just can't thank you guys enough. Um, please keep up the good work. And you know, until the next time, I hope we can talk again. All right. Well, we'd love to uh, host you at the Institute sometime. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. Take care, Jeff. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.